Um, so I'm really excited to be here with you this morning. Um, how many of you here went to the marriage conference this last weekend? It was awesome. I went, um, I went on Friday night, and uh, I was inspired by Max Licato uh, when he was speaking. He was awesome. And uh, one of the things he did before he spoke was tell a joke. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to try that. Like, if he did that, I'm going to try it. And so, thank you. You're already laughing. That's good. All right. Let's try this out. So, um, and then, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a little bit about the youth ministry because as, as Pastor Nick said, I'm the, my, my wife and I were the youth pastors here. So I'd like to just give you a little update on what's going on with that, uh, how awesome everything's uh, been going. And then, uh, and then I'm going to share a little bit about who I am, my testimony, because some of you don't know me. It's the first time you've seen me up here. And you're like, who is that? Um, so I'm, I'll, I'll share a little about who I am. And, um, but before that, let me, let me try this joke out. So <laughs> uh, there was this very wealthy man. And he lives in a faraway kingdom somewhere. And he decided to throw a huge party. And so he uh, sent out invitations throughout all the land. And uh, uh, he also sent out three uh, special invitations. And uh, he sent uh, these three special invitations to the three poorest families in the kingdom. And he asked the men of the house to meet him in the back of his glorious mansion, and he wanted to uh, talk to them about something. So the party's going, and uh, the three men meet him back behind the mansion in the gardens, and uh, they're, they're back there, and um, he looks at the three men, and he said, you're probably wondering why I asked you to meet me back here. Um, I, wanna, I wanna share with someone half of everything I own, half of all my possessions, half of all my money, um, half, half my house. Uh, I want to share ev- half of everything I have with one of you three men. And uh, the three men were excited because this, this man is very wealthy. And he said, but there's one thing you have to do. And, and before they knew it, they were in front of a swimming pool. And he said, you have to jump into the swimming pool, and the first person to make it on the other side gets a half of everything I own. And so the men look at the swimming pool, and they notice that in the swimming pool are alligators. It's full of alligators. And they're like, what? Forget this. I'm not going to do that. It's not, this is not worth my life. And so one by one, the men look at the pool, and they start walking away. And all of a sudden, there's a splash. And all the rich man and the other two men look over, and they see one of the poor men swimming as fast as he can to get to the other side of the swimming pool. And he's frantically going, and, and then... He makes it to the other side, and the rich man's like, oh my gosh, that is amazing. That is, that is incredible. I didn't think anybody would do it, but you, you get half of everything I own. You get all my, half of my possessions, half of my house, half, half of um, all my money. Uh, actually, what is the first thing you want? What is the first thing that you would like me to grant to you? And the man, he's, he's sitting on the side of the pole, and he's uh, just really tired and exhausted, and you know he's probably shaking a little bit because he almost got eaten by alligators or something. And he's just he's sitting there, and he's like, "The first thing I would like, I would like to know who pushed me in the swimming pool." <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh man, I gotta clap this service. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. But that's the only joke I have, so I will not become a comedian. So that's that's it. And I had to like look all over the internet for that one. So, um, but thank you for laughing. Um, but Megan and I believe as youth pastors that sometimes we need to push our students to be the men in God that God has created them to be. Um, so there was a point to that joke. Uh, today we have two awesome students that are in our youth ministry and we, we push them to be able to stand, not push them hard because they were like, all right, Pastor Tyler, we'll do it. But we, we ask them to share their testimonies with you today because we know that God has done a great work in their life, and God is continuing to do a great work in their life. And I just want them, in a few moments, uh, you'll hear their testimony, but I wanted them to just be able to share the story and the love of Christ that has been displayed in their life. And so we'll get to that in a few moments. But um, Megan and I, we have a huge passion for our students. And um, I didn't read the scripture the first service, but 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 8 says, And the Lord called Samuel again. And a third time he arose and went to Eli. And he said, here I am, for you've called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you again, you shall speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went down and laid down in his bed again. And the Lord came and stood and called as he did other times. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. 
You know, I read that scripture to you. That's not my text for today, so I know you guys were frantically trying to get to it. Um, I'll give that to you in a moment. But I, I read that scripture because um, that's, that's our heart for these students, that they're so in love with Christ, that they are so attentive to the word of God, that they are uh, listening and at the feet of Jesus, that they are so active in their faith that it causes, and most people miss this, but it causes God to stand it causes God to take an action to show up in, in a time of need, in a circumstance that just like Samuel, when he went down and, and was about to say, speak for your servant is listening, that God came and he stood. We see that God takes an action. And that's our heart for our students, that they are so in love with Christ. They are so on fire for him that they changed the world and they caused God to make an action in their direction. And so, guys, we've seen some amazing things in our youth ministry. We've seen students, in a few moments, we've seen students um, just turn from darkness and into light. Uh, this, the next few weeks, actually uh, about eight weeks, we have students, high school and junior high students, that are going to be preaching every Wednesday for the next eight weeks. And Megan and I, we worked with them on a sermon. We've, we've uh, a little bit, not that much, because I believe that God has placed it in their heart and they need to develop themselves. But we've kind of pushed them in the right direction. And we had students share their testimony on, youth, on our youth nights. And God is moving in our students' lives. And, 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 the, and the evidence, oh, you can clap. And, and some people ask me, how, how do you know that God's moving? I see it because I, we have a group of eight students that are willing to share a message that God has put on their life. We, we, we see it because we have two students that are going to share their testimony of what God has done in their life. The fruit is ready to be harvested, and God is using our students in mighty, mighty ways. It's been really, really cool to see. I'm going to give you my big idea for today. This, I have one point for today's sermon, just one. And so if you want to go on Facebook and post this, you know, to show people you're in church or Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> whatever you need to do, you know, I'll just put this out here right now so you can get it ready. My big idea for today is, actually the title of my message is Everything Changes. My big idea is everything changes when you encounter the king. Everything changes when you encounter the king. All right, let me say it a third time just for those who are writing it down on Twitter or Facebook. Everything changes when you encounter the king. And let me give you the scripture reference for today so you can get that ready. It's 1 Samuel chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. 1 Samuel chapter uh, 22, verses 1 through 2. For you slow people, 1 Samuel chapter 22, <laughs> verses 1 through 2. I grew up in California. I miss it a lot when it's snowing here. Like, I hate the winters here. But God called me here, so that's why I'm here. Um, the first time I had a calzone and real Italian food was when I moved out here. So I know that God has really blessed me since being here in mighty, mighty ways. Um, I grew up in California in an amazing church. It was in the Assemblies of God Church, just like Harvest Time. And uh, my pastors believed in and this is why Megan have this heart to mobilize and activate this next generation to be men and women of God. Even if they're not going to be pastors or missionaries, we believe that every student should be able to share a message through, from the word of God and share their testimony of how God changed their life, regardless of what they do, whether they're a businessman, teacher, whatever. We believe that is our mission to be able to equip our students to do that. But anyways, the reason we have that is because my pastor believed that at our church. And that was the vision that he displayed. And so... Um, I grew up in a family where my, fa my parents knew the importance of bringing their three boys, I have a twin brother and my younger brother, to church. And so at three years old, my parents started taking us to this church, and we, time and time again, continue to have encounters with the king. From a very young age, at three years old, Time and time again, we continued to have encounters with the Lord. And that was my parents' missions as parents in that temporary assignment that God had given to them to raise us, that they knew that they had to give as many uh, moments where we can encounter the king. And so there was a youth leader in this church. He eventually became a junior high pastor at this church, and now he's pastoring somewhere else. But this man was placed in my life 
to show me the love of Jesus. His name is Pastor Felix. He spoke at our last retreat um, that we had, our youth retreat. And he walked up to me and my brother at nine years old. We weren't even in the youth ministry yet. We were too young. He walked up to my brother and I, and he just wanted to hang out and talk. He just wanted to get to know who we were. He wasn't the youth pastor. He wasn't, the, he, wasn't, he, he wasn't being paid by the church, but he just wanted to know who we were. And then we started going to movies together and hanging out. We started camping out in his backyard. We developed a close relationship with this person. And then our relationship grew from that to hey, Pastor Felix, I was reading the Bible, and what does it mean by this? Can you explain this to me? And we would sit in his car, and we would talk about the word of God. And one night when I was in um, junior high, the altar call was given, and I didn't go up to the front. I went home, and we were, we, Pastor Felix drove us home, and he dropped us off, and we were talking, and I went in my room, and I had an encounter with the king, and I asked Jesus to be the Lord of my life. In my bedroom, in a quiet place, it wasn't with the lights, it wasn't with the music, it wasn't any of that. It was a personal invitation that the Lord gave straight to me in a quiet place in my home that I accepted Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And you know what? That encounter with the King forever changed my life. It didn't stop there. I continued to be involved with the church. I went on my first mission trip at the age of 15 years, uh, at age 15. And that was when the Lord called me to, to, to a full-time uh, into ministry. And then from there, I went to Evangel University, where something even, uh, not more amazing, but see, something that uh, forever changed my life is I met my beautiful bride, Megan. Some of you know who she is. She is awesome. She is so cool. Not only is she cooler than me, she is just smarter than me. She is just, like, that's why they hired me here, to be honest. <laughs> they were like, uh... Megan, we like her. You will just accept. <laughs> um, anyways, but I met her, and uh, in two, last year we got married, and, uh, and, and God has just, been, uh, has just blessed us, and it all started from that encounter with the king when I was in junior high. 1 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1 through 2 says, David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adalom. And when his brothers and all of his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And there with him were about 400 men. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this word. Lord, we thank you that many of us in this room have had encounters with you. Lord, that have forever changed our lives. Lord, I pray for those who need an encounter with you today because of the circumstance they're in. Lord, maybe someone's in here and they've never had an encounter with the king, that, they, that this is the first time they've heard about. Lord, I pray that today that that encounter will happen. Lord, we praise you and we give you the glory in your name. Amen. I want to give you a little background about this like, short text that I gave you. Um, many of you have heard of King David. He is one of the, uh, the greatest, he is the greatest king, that is the physical king, uh, person born on this earth that, that Israel has ever had. Jesus is the greatest, but David, the greatest human, uh, uh, the, the greatest person that was uh, born here on this earth, uh, that, that, that wasn't from God, that wasn't uh, born of God, um, he's the greatest king in Israel. But you know what, in this text that I read you, he was not the king. He was an outlaw in his own nation. He was on the run. He was, and he was running from the present king of Israel. And if some of, you, some of you here are in Pastor Nick's class on Wednesday nights, you know how crazy King Saul was. He is a madman, and he is bent to kill King David because he is jealous of the destiny and the plan that God put on David's life. So David's on the run, and he goes to where he can hide away and get away from King, and it's a cave. Talk about one of the lowest moments in King David's life. On the run, he's in a cave, he has nowhere to go, and what does he do? Thankfully, he cries out to God, and he asks God for help. And what do we see God do? We see God do the unexpected. Something so crazy that King David would have never imagined. Something that, like, I'm sure David was like, are you serious, God? Like, this is what you're doing? This is what you're doing in my life? I just cried out to you, and this is how you answer it? How many of you have ever been there before? 
that you're in the cave and you're on the, on the run. You feel like God is nowhere to be found. You feel like that everybody's against you. A lot of our teenagers feel like that. You need to pray for them. They feel like when they go to their schools, that ev- they're the only Christian at their school. That no one, that no one gets it. That, and, and, then, and then it's easy to slip into what everybody else is doing. And you know, you guys go through that too. You feel, man, I'm the only Christian at my workplace right now. No wonder there's a temptation to fall away from God. I'm the only person here, and I feel like I'm all by myself in the cave, of de- and, and I've cried out to God, and, 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 and I, he hasn't given me the answer that I want or need. So what was that answer that God gave to King David? It's pretty crazy. God sent the misfits, the outcasts, the people that were on the fringes of society to help King David out. Like, can you imagine David was praying to God, like, God, I'm about to die. Like, this mad king's searching after me, and you've called me to be the king. And I know that's my plan. I know that's my destiny. I don't know how you're going to bring it about. And then God sends, he doesn't send an army. He doesn't send, like, you know, like, David looked outside the cave and was like, yes, the biggest, baddest guys are coming to help me take back the land. Here we go. I'm pumped. Let's go. Let's get ready for this fight. No, that didn't happen. We see that the homeless people, the, the people that, you know, no one thought about, the people that were just uh, maybe had left, that were just uh, full of sickness or disease, the misfits came to King David's aid. But you know what's cool? is that these people, these misfits, most of you are like, what are you talking about? I read my Bible and I don't know what you're talking about. Most of these people, most people don't realize who they become. These misfits are the men who became David's mighty men. These people came to David as misfits, outcasts, but most people, when they read the Bible, they remember these, remember David's mighty men. The people that have done great feats of strength and and did great things for God. There's one of the mighty men who he fought back um, uh, their enemy and and he was fighting so long and hard that his sword fused to his hands. Crazy stuff. Mighty men of God who who rose up to be um, a great uh, military, great men for uh, King David. But when King David looked out, he didn't see the mighty men. He saw the misfits, the outcasts, the people that, how are they going to help him? But you know what's cool about God? God can take the misfits and make them mighty. Everything changes when you encounter the king. These misfits came to King David as misfits, but when they encountered King David, they became mighty. And you know what's cool, guys? King David is not our king. Jesus is our king. Jesus is our king. And when you have an encounter with the true king, Jesus, everything changes. You'll go from being a misfit to being a mighty man or woman of God. You'll go from being on the fringes of society and rising up to be all that God has called you to be and do. You go from being in a desperate situation to being in a thriving uh, environment where God has placed you in the appropriate moment to just do great things for him. Some of you are struggling financially, and you're like, God, I don't know what's going to do. But when you continue having encounters with the king, God's going to bring you, uh, bring you all that you need. My, my message is simple today. It's not anything complex. It's just a gospel-centered message that when we encounter Jesus, when we make him the ruler of our lives, Everything changes. We go being from misfits to mighty. Today I want to talk to you about the who, the what, the when, the why, and the how. And how all that changes when we have an encounter of Jesus. The first one, who. Who changes? You do. I do. Everyone is changed when they have an encounter with Jesus. We see it in the scripture that when they encountered David, they were able to be the men that God had called them to be. They became mighty. We are to go from being lost to being found in Jesus. 
We are given a purpose when we encounter Jesus. Galatians 2, chapter 2, verse 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now have, live in body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Not only are we changed by the encounter with Jesus, but those around us, those around us will also be changed. You know, when I first got here at harvest time, I took two of my students out to the mall. They're actually uh, Leah Bonsignori and Matt Bonsignori. They're here at the service. And um, we went to the mall, and uh, we go into Timberland. And um, just let you go, I have a tattoo on my arm. I know. I asked Jesus for forgiveness. No, I'm just kidding. I have a tattoo on my arm. So it says, it's a scripture. It says Luke 9, 23. Uh, Therefore, if you want to be a disciple of mine, pick up your cross and die to yourself daily. And so we go into Timberland, and um, we're like looking at the shoes and everything like that. And, uh, and, and the, the, the guy behind the register is like, oh, what, is your, what, is that, what does that mean? What is that? Um, it's a scripture, and I, and I tell him what it what it, what the scripture is and he like starts freaking out he's like oh my gosh oh my like are you serious like that that is so cool that is awesome and i'm like whoa like remember we're like sitting there and i'm like whoa this is kind of weird like i don't know what's going on this like i like people are looking like i was like this guy's freaking out and he's like i i could feel something when you walked in here i could feel something different and and he proceeded to give me like a 50 percent discount but i was like <laughs> i was like yes But the point of that story is he felt something different when we walked into that store. When myself, when Leah, and when Matt, when we walked into that room, he could feel the spirit of Christ on all three of us. And he could feel the difference. And so my hope, what what hope I want to give you today is that there's people in your life that don't know Jesus and you've been praying for them, you've been interceding for them, and you know that God is going to come in and have an encounter of their life. I just want to give you encouragement in that they are going to eventually, they are eventually going to see the encounter that you've had in your life. And that's what's going to change them. That's what's going to draw them to Jesus is they're going to see the different spirit upon your life when you have an encounter with the king. We're given a purpose when we encounter the king. Right now, um, Kayla, our first student testimony, is going to come up, and she's going to share how because when she had an encounter with the king, he gave her purpose. So I want you to give it up for Kayla. She shares. So like Tyler said, my name is Kayla. Um, my family and I have been coming to Harvest Time for like nine years now. And um, I'm a part of the youth worship team here. And I'm going to share my testimony with you. So before June of 2016, I said I was a Christian. I came to church. But I never knew what it actually meant to be a Christian or to have a relationship with God. I guess I was never really taught it, and nothing really opened my eyes to see that way. So in June of 2016, my dad's mom passed away. And a little bit about her, she was an amazing singer, but didn't pursue it out of fear. And as she noticed I was getting more involved into music, she told me, fear held me back, but it's not going to hold you back. So after she passed away, I felt lost, and I felt like I was walking, and I wasn't getting anywhere, and I felt unloved and annoyed. So by September of 2016, I had lost my faith completely. I had no respect for the church. I was rude, and my attitude towards God and anything of God changed dramatically. My friend group changed, and I got closer with people who were not good influences on my life. I got involved in Ouija boards, tarot cards, And I was even praising the devil. My soul was so dark, and it was noticeable to people around me. My attitude towards my parents changed. I was very disrespectful towards them. Every other word that came out of my mouth was a curse word. And I even started believing that there were humans that I couldn't see watching me. Fear was surrounding me constantly. I was so scared, but it felt fun. In December of 2016, I bought Justin Bieber's album, Purpose, and I loved it. But when I realized he had put some songs about his faith and God on it, I stopped listening to it. In March of 2016, I was being bullied at school for being friends with certain people. I felt like I wasn't here for a reason and I didn't have a purpose. I thought that maybe if I hurt myself, maybe, any, maybe someone would care. 
but that thought really didn't last long. The people that I had been hanging out with ditched me, spread rumors about me, and hurt me. So suicide was my next thought. But each time I thought about it, something told me one more day. After a rough day at school and coming home to fight and argue with my parents, that was the day I was going to take my life. I listened to the song Purpose by Justin Bieber randomly, and I felt overwhelmed by God. All of the thoughts of suicide were gone. I knew there was one thing I needed to do, rededicate my faith. So I went up to Megan, Pastor Tyler's wife, on a Wednesday night, and we talked for about an hour of how to move out of the situation that I was in. And she recommended finding a life verse. So very quickly, God showed me what verse was most special for my life. Proverbs 19.21. It says, you can make many plans, but the Lord's purpose will prevail. I am here for a purpose. To make an impact on people's lives and my voice is to be heard and not silent. God used Justin Bieber, out of all people, to show what Jesus can do through music. And it saved my life. That's amazing. God used Justin Bieber. But you know what? God can use anybody and anything. And so maybe someone needed to hear that. Maybe there's, you're like, that's not God. Maybe that's God trying to reach you. When we have an encounter with the king, we are changed, and others around us are changed as well. All right, the what. What changes when we have an encounter with Jesus? We are changed. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things are made new. You know what? There's many of us that hold on to things from the past. And we hold on to them and they just start controlling everything that we do, all of our decisions. And maybe maybe you've done something, maybe maybe there's something that you're not proud of, but God wants you to let go of the old things that are holding you back. And he wants to make you a new creation in him when you have an encounter with the king. What else does God change? What else happens? Our circumstances change. These mighty men, they went from being misfits to mighty. They went from being outcasts to them being on the royal guard of King David, to being in the palace, to being, in, to being his uh, top soldiers. What else changes? Our worries, our status. This, another thing that changes is our parenting. And I don't have a kid, but I want to tell you a little story about my mom. So my mom is a wonderful woman of God. And she allowed the encounter with Jesus to change every facet of her life. And that even included how she wrote, raised her three boys. And so what I say about right now is I don't, I'm not trying to say this to offend anybody or you know, make you feel bad. But I just want to share my mom's story. And I think it's really inspiring. Um, my mom, when she had an encounter with the king, she, she had a rough past. She, her, her mother died when she was young, and she was raised by a single father. And, and when, when my mom and my dad got married and they decided to rededicate their lives to the Lord, they, they instantly saw the, the change that took place when Jesus became the rule of their life. And they didn't want the same mistakes that they had made, the same hurts and the pains that they had to go through to happen with my brothers and I. And so they, they, they started to do things that my brother and I didn't like. They started to, 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 uh, to parent not based on others, but they decided to parent based on the word of God. And so I remember lots of times I'd be like, Mom, Dad, I want to go to, uh, I want to go so-and-so's house. I want my football team. And my mom's like, is there alcohol at their house? Is there, a, who, is there going to be a parent there? I'm like, Mom, but come on, they're my football team. I want to evangelize to them. Like, come on, like, let me go. And she'd be like, no, I'm not going to let you go. And I would be so mad. I would be so furious with my mom's decision. I'm like, she's not letting me, like, reach out to my friends. But my mom knew that I had a purpose. And you know what's crazy? Is looking back, I, I know 
that if I were to go to those people's houses that she didn't let me go, I know that I probably would have experimented with things I shouldn't have experimented. I knew that the pressure would have been so great that maybe I would have drank too much when I shouldn't be drinking. I know that I maybe would have tried different drugs when I wasn't supposed to be doing that because that's what all my football friends were doing. I know that I may have, would have participated in that. But because my mom didn't get trapped in the game of, oh, I got to, you know, okay, I'll let you go, give and take. No, she was grounded by the word of God, and she didn't care how mad I got. And you know what? I would say that my mom did a good job, and I'm not trying to say, oh, look at me, you know, but look at my, look at my two other brothers. My other brother's a youth pastor, and my other brother's studying to be a worship pastor. And you know what's crazy? There's a lot of people say, wow, three boys in the ministry? Your parents must be pastors. No, my dad's a police officer, and my mom works in the medical field. They were not ministers, and yet because they grounded themselves in their parenting strategies and the word of God, everything changed. You know, some stuff my mom didn't, she didn't compare herself to others because it's such a hard thing to do. We look on Facebook, social media, and say, oh, man, look what they're letting their kids do. I, I should let my kid do that too. Don't compare yourself on what other parents are doing and what, other, what social media is showing you, but, you know, say, this is what the word of God is telling me to do. And I promise you, your kids will be grounded in the word of God and they will have an encounter with the king. Just like me, I'm a testimony to that. It's all because of my mom. My mom did some crazy stuff too. Don't do this. My mom would like, if I was talking to a girl, she'd be like, she'd walk up and she'd say, what are you talking to my son for? I'd be like, mom, I'm just talking to a girl. Like, what? don't embarrass me. No joke. This I knew Megan was the one. I took a photo and we put it on Facebook. We didn't have Snapchat or anything like that. And I, and I put it on Facebook. And it was the only photo I put of Megan on Facebook. And my mom literally, she, she saw the tag. I tagged Megan in it. She found Megan on Facebook, added her as a friend, messaged her, and said, we need to talk about my son. <laughs> no, this is true. This is true. This isn't a joke. And, my, and I knew Megan was one because Megan was totally fine with it. She's like, okay, yeah, sure. She, you know, she really cares about her son. That's a little extreme. I don't know if you should do that, but, but you know what? Thank God my mom watched my back because Megan is the woman that God had for me. She is the one that God had for me. And it was really because my mom was watching my back and she took her temporary assignment to raise my, my brothers and I seriously. And again, I didn't say that to embarrass or offend anybody here. No, my heart, I just wanted to give an example of what my mom did. And I think that it was really cool. Um, the other things that change when we have an encounter with the Lord is our marriages, our singleness. If you're single, the way you approach dating and other things like that changes. Our, relation, our goals, our businesses, our, the way we view politics, our prayer life, everything changes. So what changes? Everything changes when we have an encounter with Jesus. When? This is a hard one. When? When will everything change? It's so hard. You know, we have an encounter of Jesus at the altar, and we're like, man, my circumstances are changing. Uh, how is God going to do this? Like, why is everything not changing right away? You know what? I want to give you some hope today because the misfits that encountered King David, they didn't change overnight. It was a process. So maybe some of you here are working out that process still, and God's just leading you through this life journey but, a, but everything will be changed when you encounter the king. For others of you, it happens instantly. When you have an encounter with the king, everything changes instantly. Philippians 1, chapter 1, verse 6 says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. When will it change? It's different for each person. But know this, when you have an encounter with the king, it will be brought to completion, the work that God's doing in your life. Why? Why does everything change when we have an encounter with the king? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him he might become the righteousness of God. Why does everything change? John chapter 3, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Why does everything change? Because God loves you. And he doesn't want you to continue in, in, in the mess, in, in the troubles, and in, in all the stuff that you are facing in this life. So that he sent it, so he sent his son to die on the cross. 
so that everything can change in your life. And so that bridge that separated us from God, that when it was broken, when Adam and Eve uh, sinned, when Jesus died on the cross, that, that separation that we had from us from God was bridged so that we can then have a relationship with the king. Why does everything change? Because we are to be imitators of Christ. So I made reference to my friend who just really spoke to me, who that leader, um, because I thought Pastor Felix was so cool, I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be cool like him. I wanted to talk like him. He played drums. I wanted to play drums like him, but I didn't continue that because Pastor Jason would be happy up there on the worship team. Um, but I wanted, to, I wanted to do everything like Pastor Felix because I thought he was so cool. So in a few moments, like in a, you're going to see a picture on the screen, and it's super embarrassing for me, but you're going to love it. So go ahead and put it up. So um, I'm in the back with the spiky hair and the blonde. My twin brother, you, you can probably tell who my twin brother is, um, and my younger brother is right there. So taking the photo, yes, we are wearing tie-dye, and yes, my little brother is on a carousel. I don't know what my parents were thinking. Like, this would be so cute. Let's do it. You know, like, I'm sure many of you have photos like that. Um, but I, I showed that picture because my little brother and I, um, Pastor Felix, he had spiky hair, and he dyed his hair, and we thought he was so cool. We wanted to be just like him, so my little brother would always say, I want to have, because he was a baby, he was like, I want to be, I want to have spicy hair like, like Pastor JR. I want to have spicy hair. He's trying to say spiky. Um, anyways, so we were imitators of someone we looked up to. Why does everything change? Because we are to be imitators of Christ. What, what Christ did in the Word of God we need to be imitators of him in every facet. Um, when, when the word of God says that Jesus died on the cross, I don't expect you guys to go and die on a cross, but the word of God says that we are to die to ourselves. We are to pick up our cross and we're to die to our sin and our old nature every single day. We are to be imitators of Christ. How? How does everything change? Those are the practical, really three quick things. Um, these are elementary, but you know, I feel like sometimes we need to hear the elementary things again. How does everything change? By spending time with Jesus. If I didn't spend time with Megan, our relationship would be nothing. Some of you need to spend more time with Jesus in the word, in prayer. And I'm not saying your relationship with is nothing, but maybe you need to mend some things in your relationship with Jesus. Second, is surround yourself with believers. My mom, her like, thing was, are there Christians there? Because you can hang out with some Christians. And not all Christians, too. She knew the ones that were actually living their faith and other ones that weren't. So I'll be like, Mom, let me go hang out with this person. She's like, uh, no, I know what they're doing. <laughs> she had discernment. <laughs> but surround yourself with fellow believers because that's going to help you on this journey to encountering Jesus and so you won't back away from him. And the third is serve. This is a wonderful church because many of you serve. This is why, what makes Harvest Time so great. And... But, but sometimes what happens is we treat the church like our trips to McDonald's. Some of you all love McDonald's. You love going to McDonald's, you like eating all the food, or, and, 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 you, and what happens when you eat too much McDonald's and you don't work out? You get, you get obese, you get fat. A lot of times, that's how we treat the church. We say, I'm going to feed myself with the word of God. I'm going to consume, consume, consume. I'm going to sit there with my popcorn and listen to the message. But no action takes place and we become spiritually obese. And the only way to combat that is by serving and by doing what the word of God says. And go, and therefore, make disciples. Serve in the church. Make the, we are the church, so we need to make this thing operate. Serve. In closing, the worship team can come up and join me. But lastly, I'm going to have Michael. He's going to share his last testimony with us. And then we're going to, then we're going to take some action of having an encounter with the king. So give it up for Michael as he comes up and he shares his testimony. All right, so my name is Michael, for those that don't know me. I've been coming here for church for about four years now. Today I'm going to share how one little encounter with God was the best thing that ever happened to me and how it truly changed everything for me. When I first started coming to church here, I was like any other kid that first starts coming to church. I had no clue what was going on or why I was here. I had a low attention span and never really paid attention to any of the messages. I was basically just coming here because my grandparents brought me here. 
My relationship with God was non-existent. Around that time, I was going through some hard and challenging things, which I still deal with to this day. Both my parents aren't in my life, which is still the case. But I've learned that with God, I can have happiness and joy in my heart no matter what I go through. Let me share my story. Life before I started coming to church here, I had little exposure to God, but not enough. I knew God existed, but I had no clue you can have such a relationship with him. Having what I have now with Jesus, I'm kind of mad that I never had that before with him. I used to spend a lot of time with my parents. Life back then was pretty nice and simple, and I had no worries. Fast forward about sixth grade, when I was about 11 years old. This was around the time my dad was sent to prison. This was a dis difficult situation in my life at such a young age. It was like everything was going good, and then all of a sudden, my perspective of life changed. I started to go through depression, and that went away about a year later. I learned to deal with everything, and I felt like I was back to normal, and the depression went away. But then I was faced with the most difficult situation of my life. My mom had an asthma attack and fell into a coma. This literally came out of nowhere. At this point, I had no clue what to think. Now the depression I once had was back and stronger more than ever. I had no clue what would happen to me now that I didn't have both my parents. Lucky enough, I had two willing grandparents to take me and my sisters in through all that. They sacrificed a lot to take care of us and still do to this day. Even though they're not here right now, I want to thank them because without them, I probably wouldn't be here today. This is how it changed. So I don't have both my parents in my life, but I am no longer going through any depression. Just because I started coming to church here and became a Christian doesn't mean my circumstances have changed. Even though I'm going through all these difficult situations, though, that doesn't stop me from having joy and happiness in my heart from God. This is how my life changed for the better. One Saturday at church, at the end of my eighth grade year, Kurt, one of the youth uh, leaders, pretty sure everyone knows Kurt, uh, he came up and invited me to youth group and started telling me about it. I was kind of hesitant at first because I was like, why is he inviting me to this? I don't, I don't want to go. <laughs> but then I started listening and I decided to go the Wednesday night after. When I first got there that Wednesday, I had no clue what to think. I didn't know if I would be accepted there. I was introduced to some of the kids and I made new friends. Youth group seemed like fun, so I started going week after week. I soon learned that I'm accepted there no matter what and that God doesn't judge me. It was fun seeing my friends week after week at youth group, but there's more to youth group than that. It's also about having a relationship with God, learning about him, talking to him, and reading about him, which I didn't really learn until a couple years ago when um, I was invited to the youth retreat. I went to this event because I thought it would be a fun weekend to just hang out with my friends, but little did I know, God has something huge in store for me. At the, at the retreat, my cousin, Cyril Posha, he shared his testimony, and I wanted to show him some support, so I paid attention for once and listened. <laughs> I saw and heard the way that God helped him and how God changed his life. So while I was listening, I thought to myself, I want what he has. So after he shared his testimony, they had an altar call, which I raised my hand to and said yes, and I accepted it. I had my first real encounter with Jesus. After that, we then worshiped, and it was like God came alive inside of me. I had this, all of a sudden, this desire to worship. There I was starting to sing along with the worship team. I started to put my hands up, not really knowing why, but I continued. It was like all of a sudden, I didn't care what others around me thought of me. I then closed my eyes and started to pray for the first time. God showed himself to me, and I felt God's presence with me. I felt the Holy Spirit inside of me, and it was like it all just became alive. So right then and there, I made a decision to give my life to Jesus and to serve him from there on out. Since then, I've grown in my relationship with Jesus more and more and continue to grow with him daily. All the depression I once was going through and once had was now gone, but this time I knew it was for good. All the anger inside of me just vanished and disappeared. And I now know that God loves and cares for me, and he gives me a sense of security and wholeness. Uh, this particular Bible verse I like to go back to, uh, speaks to me. Uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm. Plans to give you a hope and a future. 
this is just the beginning of my testimony, and I know that God has big things in store for me, and the best is yet to come. Thank you. Would you stand with me? My main point, only point, is everything changes when you encounter the king. What we're going to do is I'm going to pray for you. And then we're going to have a little time for worship. And what we worship, I just want you to have your own personal encounter with the king. Some of you need to dedicate your life to him. That you're going to serve the true king. Some of you just need that extra just lift up today to give you strength to get through this next week. Have your encounter with the king because when you do, everything changes. Lord, I just thank you for this word. Lord, I thank you for your promise, Lord, that when we encounter you, our lives will never be the same. Lord, I thank you for these two testimonies, these two students that share their testimonies. Lord, I pray that you just continue to do the work that you begin and bring it to completion. Lord, I thank you for their hearts and their willingness to be used by you at this time and share the story that, that is part of their life. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, that they have an encounter with you as we worship. Lord, that those who need to uh, dedicate their lives to you today, they will choose to serve you. Lord, that those who just say, you know, I need to have an encounter with the Lord to just get me through this next week. Lord, that right now, that this encounter with you will sustain them until we meet again next week. Lord, we praise you and we love you.